that's associated with the fast movements of Baroque concertos. And this is the form that's referred to as Ritornello form. And it's not uh, nearly as specific and detailed as Sonata Allegro form is in the classical period. It's more an idea. Um, it's very similar to um, what you're going to find in a fugue that is based on one main idea. This is something that is a good example of this doctrine of affections. So the main idea is called the Ritornello theme. The Ritornello theme, this Ritornello means returning. So this is a theme that is going to continually return throughout a movement. So the Ritornello theme is similar to the subject of a, of a Baroque fugue, like of a Bach fugue, how a subject is stated at the beginning by itself. And in a fugue, then it's a polyphonic work, which has all of these entrances of all the voices in a layered effect. But it's all based on the subject that's stated at the beginning. So it's the same situation with Ritornello construction in a Baroque concerto. So the Ritornello theme is stated by the orchestra, by the, the Ripiano. Then, either the concertino, if it's a concerto grosso, or if it's a solo concerto, then the soloist then would elaborate. There would be a section that the soloist would elaborate on that Ritornello theme and would be accompanied by the Ripiano. So during these solo sections, then the, the orchestra would really thin. And basically, this was a string orchestra. So you didn't have then the four families of instruments that arose at the beginning of the classical era. Instead, it's basically the strings that the Ripiano, plus big and bass. So you have a keyboard player and um, doubling of the bass line. So this, this passage then, would feature a modulation to a closer related key. So typically, if you're in major, you go to dominant. If you're minor, you go relative major. It would cadence. So it serves like a transitional passage. When it would cadence in the new key, then the ripiano would restate a portion of the ritornello theme. So you just have like the beginning of the ritornello theme that would be restated. So we'll put your modulates. Cadences, and then Ritornello. is restated by Ribiano. And it just follows this process for the entire movement. And so it's just a series of statements and restatements of the Ritornello theme by the orchestra, by the Ripiano, 
that is separated with solo passages that develop the theme and that modulate through this key scheme. It's not specific exactly how many interior statements and restatements of the Richard Nello theme that you expect. It just depends on the, the scope of the work. Um, Johann Sebastian Bach wrote the biggest. You know, so the one that we're going to listen to is one of the longest and, and uh, most complex of this type of structure. Um, another really important composer of concerti was Vivaldi. And so um, you can see the same basic idea in, in his concerti. But so we'll put here. It follows this process. And the movement is going to end Concerta from the very beginning was associated with a three movement structure. So it would have outer movements that were fast tempos and then a middle movement that was a slow tempo and it would typically be a contrasting key for that second movement. We're going to see that that continues in the classical period that the concerto is always associated with a three movement construction. So I'll put your Baroque concerto um, because we're going to have different forms that then emerged in the classical period. But in the Baroque, this Ritronello plan is the most typical. And slow movement would be contrasting key. It would be um, a slow movement. And very often it was based on what's called a ground bass, which is an ostinato pattern that's presented in the bass, which is like a passacaglia, except that it modulates. A passacaglia, on the other hand, which is a type of theme and variation that we talked about with Brahms, but that type of, of, uh, of instrumental work arose in the Baroque period, and the passacaglia would basically stay in one key and it wouldn't modulate. So uh, a ground bass idea would present this, this bass line at the, at the beginning by the Ritronello or by the Ripiano group. And then the solos would come in and would be just like a, a, a Arioso type writing. It was more embellished. Um, so it's kind of like a vocal style. And it though would feature a modulation that would occur, but you'd have this ostinato pattern that was going on, you know, continually restating the same theme in the bass. So, very often that's what you see in a Bach concerto, is this ground bass pattern. So that's what you see in the D minor concerto, for instance, for the keyboard. All right. Okay, so another term that you should know in connection with the concerto is the solo passage that would be placed at often at the end of a fast movement, which is the passage that's known as the cadenza.
So one of the chief, one of the main features of the concerto is the virtuosic writing that's associated with the solos. And so the cadenza then was the place that would feature the most virtuosic writing. And so it was the uh, you know dramatic high point of the movement. It was something that um, could be improvised. Um, sometimes it's written out. What we're going to see in the Brandenburg Fifth is that there is an elaborate cadenza that's written out for the harpsichord. So this Brandenburg Fifth is a concerto grosso that has a concertino group that has violin, flute, and harpsichord, at least three instruments, with the harpsichordist having a dual purpose because the harpsichordist is a member of the concertino group but also realizes then the figure bass notation and is playing during the ripiano passages as part of the continuum. So the keyboard player in, in this work plays continuously through the whole movement. But um, in the classical period, we're going to see that there's a, a, a much more you know, structured uh, expectation to the cadenza. And we'll talk about that with then the, the second concerto that we study, which is one of the Mozart piano concertos. And um, so, but the, the idea of improvisation is something that's typically associated with, with a cadenza. So I, I think what I want to do uh, next is to, to uh, look at this work. Um, and then we'll talk about Bach and his contributions and, and um, the importance of the, the literature of Johann Sebastian Bach. But I think let's, let's listen to the first movement of the Brandenburg Fifth Concerto. So there's no, no greater composer in, in the common practice period. Um, then Johann Sebastian Bach. Bach was a German composer. He never left Germany. And he was someone who was not a cosmopolitan um, style, um, as opposed to someone like Mozart, who traveled throughout Europe and really assimilated lots of different influences. Bach was from a family of musicians. So there are seven generations of Bachs that were his predecessors that were musicians. And so um, Bach um, had 20 children, and four of his sons then were leading composers of the next generation, the most important of whom is Carl Philip Emanuel, CPE Bach, who is sometimes dubbed the father of the classical style. So he was writing this new style that was happening during the last 25 years of Bach's life. So Bach is someone who was a great assimilator rather than being an innovator. So he basically took the genres and the, the, the styles and types of works that were present that had arisen during the Baroque era, and he just wrote the greatest examples of these different types of genres that were possible. The only type of work that he didn't like was opera. But he wrote um, oratorios, and he wrote um, settings of the Passion of Christ, the, the two of those, the St. Matthew Passion and St. John Passion, which incorporated the same musical structures as an opera. So it had, um, it had registies, it had arias, and had instrumental sections um, which were similar to like an overture. Um, so one of the important uh, genres that Bach developed was the concerto. And Bach's career followed the basic possibilities um, for a composer at that time, which is either being employed by the courts or employed by the church. And so the first part of his career, he was a court musician. And this was in Weimar and in Kirtan. 
And then in 1723, he landed the most important church position in the Protestant world in Germany, which was in Leipzig for the St. Thomas Church. And so the last 27 years of his life, then he was writing um, his music for the Protestant uh, Lutheran church service. And so that tended to, to you know, feature more of his sacred compositions like his over 200 cantatas. Um, so the Brandenburg Fifth Concerto comes from the period just before he was hired in Leipzig. was employed by the Ducal Court in Curtin, and he wrote six Brandenburg Concerti. And the one that we are going to do is number five in D major. So those are your dates. This is a three movement work, and we're going to be listening to the first movement, which is in Ritornello form. One thing that you should do now is to download the theme sheet for this section on Concerto. When you download that theme sheet, you will see the first thing is a chart um, of the first movement of, of the Brandenburg Fifth. And basically what the chart has is it, it just um, is, um, represents the theme which is presented at the beginning by the orchestra, that Richard Nello theme. And that chart also gives the key. And so I use the abbreviations R for Ripiano and C for Concertino. So the Concertino is elaborating on the Ritornello theme, but every time you see the letter R, then that indicates a restatement of a portion of the Ritornello theme. And you can see how many different keys it goes through. So this opening movement's over 10 minutes long, and um, it's just this continual development of um, that Ritornello theme. So you have the idea of you know, this continuous forward movement um, that is something that is characteristic of this fourth student, this continuous thematic unfolding. And so when you're looking at the score, the places in the score where you have figured bass notation, those are all of the Ripiano passages. So that's the place where the keyboard player then is then realizing the numbers. But you can kind of keep the place that way, it's just kind of uh, following the score and noting the spots that have figured bass, because those are the orchestra parts. Right, the uh, back page. 